now, on to the main event. Our, uh, this presentation is a student cafe, so it's being managed by the fourth annual, this is the fourth annual Georgetown University Student Cafe. And uh, we have our two faculty members, Jeannie Jacobitz and Cindy Farley from Georgetown. And this is the 26th cohort who will be doing this presentation on Eating for Two, the intersection of food, culture, and childbearing. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Cindy. Just let me give you the right, Cindy. All right. There you go. All right. Now the slides are yours. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, my name's Cindy Farley, as uh, Lorraine mentioned. I am a professor at Georgetown University in their midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner program. We're delighted to be here uh, for the fourth year in a row. And we're presenting uh, on Eating for Two, the intersection of food, culture, and childbearing. The learning activity that we're about to describe resulted in a self-published cookbook, and we named that Multicultural Meals with Midwives, a cookbook for the childbearing year. The cover of the first edition cookbook is noted on this slide. And here is a wonderful picture of cohort 26 and faculty at one of our on-campus intensives, giving the universal hand signal for the vagina. Uh, eight students of this cohort, myself and my colleague, Jean Jacobwitz, will be sharing our experiences in learning about food culture and childbearing through cooking. So off to you, Jean, to share how this all got started. Thank you, Cindy, and hello from Washington, D.C. Respecting and understanding diverse cultures plays a significant role in how successful we as midwives are in communicating with the women we attend and in promoting the health of mothers and babies. Our students live in rural and urban communities from all over the United States with very diverse populations. With this in mind, graduate midwifery students in our intrapartum, postpartum, and newborn care course chose a culture for the assignment, celebrating diversity in childbirth. The culture could be from a community where they hope to practice, from within their own family or friends, or simply a culture they were interested in exploring. The students were instructed to prepare a presentation that explored childbirth-related beliefs, customs, traditions, and rituals of their chosen culture present a history of the culture or country, information on the history and status of midwives if available, and how traditional birth attendants and professional midwives interacted. Discuss significant maternal and newborn public health concerns in their chosen culture, and discuss challenges to access care, particularly in regions with limited transportation and in some places, unsafe roads for travel. Beliefs about foods to eat or to avoid during pregnancy, postpartum, and breastfeeding were commonly encountered. During the spring semester in 2017, my older daughter, Lauren, gave birth to my grandson, Jake, seen here at birth, used in our first edition, and one year later, from our new second edition. While I was searching for nutritious recipes to prepare for my daughter, I discovered a wonderful and easy to prepare postpartum Moroccan stew made with lentils, sweet potatoes, apricots, and ginger. The stew is rich in protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals that support breastfeeding and postpartum healing. In fact, once Jake started on solid food, he loved it as well. It was delicious, and after an excited discussion with Dr. Cindy Farley, our cookbook, Multicultural Meals with Midwives, was born. We envisioned the creation of a cookbook I'm going to I apologize, sounds, sounds of the city, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, it was a delicious recipe and after an 
excited discussion with Dr. Cindy Farley, our cookbook, Multicultural Meals with Midwives, was born. We envisioned the creation of a cookbook together with our students and colleagues at Georgetown University to enhance the experiential aspects of learning through food preparation and sharing common to selected cultures. Our first edition was so successful, we decided to publish a second edition. For the second edition of our cookbook, I chose Korea. I was inspired to include Korea to honor my good friend, Min Ja Jung. She was the first person to visit after Jake was born, bringing a traditional Korean postpartum seaweed soup, commonly prepared for new mothers, rich in iodine, fiber, and many vitamins and minerals. The history of this soup is interesting. It's believed that many years ago, Korean fishermen observed whales eating large amounts of seaweed after they gave birth to their calves. They assumed this was to promote healing and thus began to include seaweed soup in the diet of postpartum mothers. The soup is also made on birthdays to honor the day of birth. We hope you enjoy this culinary journey where food becomes an entry into understanding culture. And happy International Day of the Midwife to everyone. Liliana Correa, one of our students, will now discuss Spain, her chosen culture. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. So I decided to pick um, Spain. Uh, my name is Lily and I live in Miami, Florida, um, but I am of Spanish descent. I was actually born in Cuba, but my great grandparents migrated from Spain. Um, Spain is located in the southwestern part of Europe and occupies most of the Iberian Peninsula. It has neighboring countries such as France, Portugal, and Morocco. Midwives in Spain go by different titles, including matronas, alcahuetas, and parteras. Their duties involve hymen repair, treatment of infections, preventing pregnancies, and helping with abortion care. Addi additional functions included carrying out baptisms for babies that, a, that had a high risk of death. And this was considered so important, in fact, that it was included in curriculums for midwifery studies until 1888. They acted as teachers of their own apprentices up until the end of the 18th century, um, a time in which teaching of midwives was established in the Royal Colleges of Surgery. The transmission of this knowledge would be passed down between women in the same family. Not only would these individuals learn midwifery from either their mothers or grandmothers, but they would also inherit the family business. The involvement of doctors and surgeons disrupted the process of passing down this knowledge from, one, from women to women. Due to the disappearance of independence for midwives, by the 19th century, they would work as physician's assistants during childbirth. Today, the resurgence of midwives is seen with the Marea Rosa, or Pink Tide, a group of midwives that fight for recognition of their clinical and social work. This practice is undergoing a change to become a more broad and diverse disciplinary area that involves care of the mother in pregnancy, birth, and normal postpartum period. Pregnancy and childbirth are celebrated greatly in Spain. Newborns will be gifted jewelry, including black amber, to bring good fortune and protect them from evil. These may come in different forms of bracelets, brooches, or earrings, as baby girls have their ears pierced within the first weeks of being born. Baptism is also a huge milestone, milestone for newborns as it is considered to be the child's initiation to the church family. During the ceremony, their appointed godparents accompany them and they are ushered into early stages of their religious life. Food is also very, very important. Um, the pictures you see here are the torijas that I made. And torijas are a Spanish version of French toast. It's, it consists of slices of stale bread being dipped in a mixture of eggs, milk, cinnamon, and in this case, sweet red wine. Torijas were given to expectant mothers during the antepartum and postpartum period. It was thought that due to the high caloric content of the dish, it had the ability to restore energy to the woman during these times. This recipe provides women with fats, soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, as well as thiamine and riboflavin and vitamin B12. In addition to its high caloric intake, the dish is easy and cheap to prepare, making it popular in households where money and food were scarce. The major difference between Spanish torijas and French toast is just the addition of either um, 
sweet white or red wine. In making the dish, I found that it was very easy. I could see why it was so widely used in Spain. Um, and it was delicious. I actually made it for my roommates. Um, and we actually ate after that picture with, was taken. The house smelled of cinnamon for a while, but it was very, very interesting um, to add the wine into the mixture. Um, and it was really fascinating to learn about a culture that is in my own history. Thank you and happy International Day of Midwives. Thank you, Lily. Um, my name is Jen Glorioso. I'm uh, a nurse midwife and women's health nurse practitioner student at Georgetown. Um, I currently live in Maryland, which um, is Hartford County. So there's a lot of rural and urban kind of mix. Um, midwifery care in my area is very medicalized uh, with the majority of births taking place in hospital. My goal for when I'm done school, um, I'm very interested in opening a practice that offers a safe space for women, um, whether they would like to deliver at home or in a birth center or um, have a hospital birth options. Uh, right now, my current clinical site is in York Hospital in Pennsylvania. Um, it's very high volume, a high risk site, so I'm getting a lot of variety of experience. Um, but one of my first interpartum clinicals was with a home birth midwife that specifically cared for the Amish population in Lancaster and the surrounding air, um, counties. I was so fascinated. Uh, we would do lots of home visits. Uh, with the women once they were 36 weeks and, um, and greater as they weren't able to travel and did not want to be seen publicly um, pregnant. So just having an insight into their culture was very, very interesting. Um, just fascinating with their beliefs and values. It's a whole other way of life. Um, so I chose for this project the Amish of Lancaster. Um, as of June 2018, there's an estimated 330,000 Amish spread across the United States and Canada, with the majority residing in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. Um, they are a religious group with roots from a Swiss Christian religion. Um, and their main virtues, they're all about God's will um, and living by God's way. Um, main virtues of humility, obedience, simplicity, and hard work. They are extremely private, which I thought was so interesting because um, they're such a tight-knit community with the church um, and very community-based, but extremely private when it comes to sex. Um, and any childbirth um, is just not discussed at all, uh, not freely. It's it's kind of like a taboo. Um, so it was very interesting to see that and especially interesting when couples came in for um, infertility. <laughs> um, they were just, they just needed to be guided in how that worked. Um, they have very large families, the average amount of about five children. I think the most I saw, Grand Maltip had about 20 um, children. The majority of births take place in the home with their partner as a, a support person. Um, and it was very fascinating as well that the Amish women can really clamp down a cervix when they're in labor if the situation isn't just right, the environment. So, you know, if their children are awake or the men are still at work or in the field, um, they will really stop labor completely. And then once everything's right, it just it just progresses and there's a baby. <laughs> um, Celebration in the community occurs after the baby is born. Like I said, since they're very private, it's not discussed even though they're showing. Um, it's not talked about. So celebration occurs after the baby. Uh, food is brought to the house to celebrate the new infant, including homemade meals and sweets. Um, and they really, the Amish labor hard, therefore they eat hearty. So it's a lot of um, calories and fats and carbs but they're working in the fields all day. So they, they do, they work that off. Um, so I chose a shoe fly pie. It's a simple yet classic Amish um, pie made for celebrations. Not only is it delicious, but shoe fly pie can be made with um, black strap molasses, which is a natural source to increase iron levels. For the postpartum woman, eating this pie can replenish her strength and iron levels after birth. 
So the shoe fly pie um, recipe that I picked, thank you, Cindy, um, was a recipe that I found online. Um, it was very easy to follow. And I used a Pillsbury just pre-made pie crust, um, but you could use any kind of pie crust or you could make one. I probably next time would make a pie crust just because it needed to be a little bit thicker um, to hold all the, the molasses. But it was very simple, just um, a few ingredients. It doesn't take very long to make. The whole house smelled delicious of um, the molasses cooking and who doesn't love a pie. Um, well, my husband is not a fan of molasses, I found out. So <laughs> you definitely, it's all molasses. So if you're a fan of molasses, it's delicious. Um, I think I probably would have put some more crumbs on top. My um, crumbs didn't. Uh, turn out as well as this picture um, but it was very good and um, my daughter and I both enjoyed it very well so it was fun to make it was a very fun assignment um, and I very I learned a lot about what more the Amish uh, ate and what their births were like so thank you and happy International Day of the Midwife you are now Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, my name is Tristan. I am currently live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm actually from Maryland too, so I'm practically Jen's neighbor. Um, but I am um, basically when I in, in the state of Massachusetts where I plan on practicing after I graduate um, with my midwifery degree and my women's health nurse practitioner degree in August um, is in Massachusetts. And so um, midwives in Massachusetts, they do have full practice authority. However, um, nurse practitioners do not. So hopefully, um, you know, within the next coming um, new legislation that will change. Um, but I'm currently actually in clinical in Providence, Rhode Island, where I work with a handful of doctors and about seven midwives on a practice. Um, and the midwives there, they um, see a pretty diverse group of patients and they deliver about 500 births a year at Women and Infants Hospital. And so today, I, um, for my cultural project, I want to talk about the Romanian culture. And I chose this culture because my grandfather was born in Romania in 1923. Um, and I actually just found this out not too long ago. Um, so I wanted to really learn a little bit more about um, where he, where I came from, where he came from, and maybe what his birth was like a little bit. Um, my best friend is also Romanian, and um, she has two children, and I am the godmother to her older child, her son. Um, and this family has really just uh, adopted me into their family. Um, I've become a big part of their lots of things that they've done. I, I always feel very included. They're very warm, loving people. Um, and godparents play a really big role throughout the whole child's whole life. So um, that was something definitely interesting for me. Um, so I just wanted to figure out your kind of, you know, get to know their, their culture a little bit more and um, see where all this kindness came from. Um, so the Romanian culture is deep-seated in traditions and folklore. Pregnant women were thought to have a direct connection with cosmic rhythm and the Earth's fertility. People used to, and actually still do, throw water on expectant mothers in times of drought, and that would be to help bring rain so that they could, you know, have more fruitful crops. Um, midwives were thought to be the protectors. Um, midwives were thought to be the protectors of mothers and unborn children. So they would practice magic and rituals to protect the couplet from dark forces, such as the evil eye or from fright. Midwives were also used to help induce fertility by the use of water rituals between childless women and new mothers. Today in Romania, midwifery is actually in a pretty poor state. Um, unfortunately, midwifery education was abolished um, in 1978, and at this time, birth was moved out of the home with um, the help of a midwife and taken in and moved into the hospital um, with a doctor. And then 
midwives took on a more um, role of a community health nurse, where they are still really um, holding that role, that that's their main responsibility, um, and where they provide a lot of home visits in rural villages to provide prenatal care, newborn care, uh, nutrition, breastfeeding education, and also where they do a lot of like newborn measurements and um, just, you know, monitoring and growth. Today, there's only about a thousand midwives practicing in Romania, and um, it Romania has some of the highest rates of maternal and infant mortality in the EU. So the dish I chose to make is um, called sarmale, which is actually cabbage rolls. And this is considered by many to be um, Romanian's national dish. Uh, because of where Romania is located, it is very, um, it has a lot of influence from its surrounding countries in like the Balkan area, Germany, Turkey. Um, so a lot of their dishes are um, versions of foods that you'll find in those countries as well. However, many, including the Romanians, say that they do it better. Um, so this dish, the sarmale, is a, um, it's traditionally served at baptisms and holidays. And I actually, um, we had this dish at my godson's baptism, which I didn't really know at the time that it was very traditional for that kind of celebration. But now doing this um, assignment, it was very cool to see that. It's traditionally made with minced pork and rice. Um, lots of spices, and it's rolled up around cabbage leaves, and you can either use um, fresh cabbage leaves or you can also use um, pickled cabbage leaves, which some say it tastes better with pickled. However, it is a little bit harder to find, um, so e using fresh cabbage leaves works just as well. Um, after rolling everything up, then you, um, you simmer it for hours on end in a pot. Traditionally, it was made in a, um, in a, a clay pot. However, I did not have a clay pot, so I just used a cast iron, which I thought still worked out very nicely. Um, and you put it in a bath of tomatoes and sauerkraut juice and other spices. And um, it cooks for quite a long time. It's a pretty tedious um, dish to make. However, it's worth every minute that you spend on it. And the trick is to really just to make enough to feed an army because it's wonderful if after, you know, um, it's frozen and reheated um, at a later time. So Somali is good for people who, as women and families, especially in the early postpartum period, um, because it is a dish that can be reheated. It's full of fat and protein, and it's very, very comforting. Um, so it's very um, convenient for those early postpartum days. And the best part about this dish is that the longer it sits, the better it tastes. And I ate this dish for about a week and a half because I was, it was just me and I had so much of it, but it was, it was wonderful and I can't wait to make it again. So happy International Day of the Midwife and thank you very much. Thank you, Tristan. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Hass, and I am from a small rural community in the northwest corner of North Dakota. Um, the clinic I'm currently at is pretty rural. We are very medicalized in our childbirth. Um, home birth is not common at all in my area. Um, so the culture I chose was the women of the Netherlands because home birth is in fact, quite common there. And they are known around the world for their excellent maternity care system. So disclaimer before I start, I do not speak Dutch. There are a couple of terms in here that I may be completely pronouncing wrong. Um, I've used Google Translate to try and get me close. So I apologize if I'm saying it wrong. Um, so the Netherlands is a country nestled between Belgium and Germany, bordering the North Sea. It boasts a population of just over 17 million people. And as I said, it is known around the world for its excellent maternity care system. Midwives are well respected and are the labor attendant of choice for a majority of births. In fact, approximately 96% of women will receive at least some care from a midwife during their pregnancy. Midwives are educated in university systems leading to a Bachelor of Science and a rigorous risk selection informs care of the pregnant woman and her options for birth care. Home birth remains common. As such, Crom Pocket is a maternity care package of care for women who give birth at home. It's provided by Dutch Insurance. It includes 
tangible supplies such as peri pads, gauze, antiseptic solutions, and other items for labor, birth, and postpartum care. Following delivery, Kramzorg is a service of healthcare workers in the Netherlands who supplement the postpartum care of midwives by visiting parents and their infants in the home in the days and weeks following birth to provide tangible support and assure a smooth and safe transition. They will do things everywhere from providing education on breastfeeding to cleaning the home and changing diapers. Uh, frequent clinical and social support is protective against postpartum depression and assists with positive adjustments to the parental role and can prevent morbidity and save lives. So there are a couple of fun traditions that the Dutch um, do observe. The first being Geburtekarche, which is essentially similar to the American birth announcement. Um, it's a, it translates to birth card. They have a photo of the baby. They put their uh, weight, their length, the date of birth, time they were born. And many will even put big signs in their yards, which is kind of unique. Um, the second is Miskite mit Meisches, which roughly translate to rusk with mice, which sounds entirely unappetizing, but it is very common to be served postpartum, and you'll see that in the picture here. So in 17th century Netherlands, women were served anisette, which is an anise seed liquor in the birthing bed immediately following delivery. Tradition has it that anise was useful in stimulating lactation, shrinking the uterus, and warding off evil spirits. It was also seen as a symbol of fertility. If anisette was not available, the woman was offered anise seeds. It wasn't until 1860 that candy-coated anise seeds, or maishes, were developed. It is thought that the name maishes, which translates to mice, as I said, is given due to the tapered end of the anise seed, which can resemble a small mouse tail. Today, these maishes are served atop a piece of buttered rusk, which is a twice-baked crusty bread, and offered to family, friends, and other postpartum visitors. Blue and white maishas represent boys, pink and white represent girls, and for Dutch royalty they use orange. So this is a dish that I did not honestly think that I was going to enjoy. I am not a fan of black licorice, and for those of you that have had anise seed, um, know that it tastes like black licorice. My children do not like it either. However, I was pleasantly surprised when I made this recipe. It was really pretty delicious actually. Um, I ordered the maishas online from Amazon because none of the <laughs> grocery stores in my area had them, um, but I did make the rusks from scratch, which um, was actually a pretty easy process. It made my house smell like you know, fresh baked bread, and so it was really great, and both my children and myself and my husband all thought this was a really great <laughs> Yeah, unlike, okay. unlike anything I'd ever had before, and you didn't even really notice the um, the black licorice flavor. So akin to our bubblegum cigars that were popular when I was born, blue for boys, pink for girls, this is kind of reminded me of that. So it was a fun tradition. It was, I could see how it would be something that's carried on. Um, I have read on many blogs that a lot of people are not fans of this dish. So they try to avoid visiting their friends immediately postpartum based on their dislike of the flavor. However, I thought it was great. So thank you so much for listening and happy International Day of the Midwife. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Amanda White. I am a student nurse midwife at Georgetown University and I've been a labor and delivery nurse in Maryland in the US for six years. Midwives in Maryland do have full practice authority, including home births and birth centers. Um, but like, like being said earlier, most of the women deliver in hospitals with doctors. We do have full prescriptive authority, which includes opioid addiction management, which is actually really important in this state as unintentional overdose is a high cause of maternal mortality. And next semester, I'm going to be in a small East where there are deliveries for babies that are 36 weeks old and over. There's no in-house obstetrician or anesthesiologist, and they have about 30 births each month. So I'm really excited to have a more um, midwife-centered uh, practice and participate this semester. Uh, the culture that I chose to research is India, 
while I do love eating Indian food, I have never been there and I was really interested in the intersection of ritual and food and birth. I was also interested to learn about the evolution of uh, midwifery in such an older culture. So some Indian birth traditions regarding the midwife. The Central Board of Nursing and Midwifery was established by the British government in 1902. And then in 1947, the new government of India created an organization to help regulate midwifery training. In the past few decades, however, the number of hospital births have increased. And this is partially linked to funding from the government that has gone more towards um, doctor education versus midwifery education and incentives to women to deliver in institutions as opposed to home, which historically most Indian women did uh, prefer to deliver at home. Um, currently, there are two successful midwifery centers, including the Healthy Mother and Fernandez Hospital. The Indian Nurse Council Register graduates um, as nurse midwives or registered nurse, <clears throat> registered nurse and registered midwife. So they're both recognized in India as midwives that can deliver. However, many of the ANMs focus on family planning and don't actually conduct births on a regular basis. So now there are current efforts to transition midwifery education back to more of the hands-on training to increase our management of the pregnancies and deliveries themselves. Um, as of 2014, there were approximately 800,000 of the ANMs and 1.5 million of the registered nurses, registered midwives. Um, currently, about one third of the deliveries are conducted by midwives than are conducted by doctors. There are still maternal and infant health disparities that exist in India, depending on their class, location, wealth, and education. India has a strong culture that has multiple religions, 20 languages, and 225 dialects. It is actually the birthplace of four of the world's major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Pregnancy is celebrated by immediate and extended family, and often a new mother's mother or mother-in-law will stay with her at home for the first month after delivery. She'll help with child care and rest. Some of the other birth traditions include a purifying ceremony for the infant once the umbilical cord is detached, bearing of the placenta, oil massages for mother and baby, pre-lacteal feeds where the woman feels like her breast milk in the first few days doesn't have enough tradition for the baby. So as we know, typically that's when the colostrum is there. And so a lot of times they will feed the baby something else such as um, water with sugar. Um, for that transition before, uh, before breastfeeding. Applying a black dot to the forehead of the infant for a protection from evil eye. Consuming garlic postpartum, and that seemed to help the uterus contract back down. And consuming milk, butter, and ghee to increase their milk supply postpartum. Regarding food, a lot of Indian culture may uh, live according to the Ayurveda lifestyle, which seeks to have a balance of mind, body, and soul. And they feel like eating different foods at different parts of your periods of your lifetime aids in this balance. <clears throat> and it has existed for over 2,500 years. Specific recommendations will vary from region to region, but generally pregnancy is seen as a hot state and postpartum is more of a cold state. And that doesn't necessarily link to the actual temperature of the food being consumed. Um, but generally, the hot state is recommended to eat more acidic, salty foods and high protein foods, and during a cold state to eat sweeter foods like vegetables and fruits that might be suggested during that period. So I wanted to challenge myself, and I took a recipe that um, had bitter gourd was highlighted as the main ingredient. I thought, what is that? That's Sounds very interesting. I've never heard of it before. Um, so I decided to cook with that. Um, so it's Corella Masala is the dish. It is quick and healthy with lots of different spices in it, which is um, part of the reason why I love Indian food so much. It's a great source of vitamin A, B1, B3, and C, magnesium, zinc, manganese, iron, potassium, and fiber. It also has mild laxative properties that can help with pregnancy-related constipation. It has twice the calcium of spinach, double the potassium of a banana, and lots of antioxidants. Um, it's a warm dish that helps replenish your nutrients and also is suggested to increase milk supply postpartum. So preparing the dish was pretty straightforward. Lots of cutting up the ingredients, making sure things were timed right, but it only took about 25 minutes to make. Um, lots of spices. 
And as I said before, and I loved mixing them, all, all of those spices together and cooking them at different times and just smelling the evolution of the flavors. It was very um, intoxicating with all of the different smells in my kitchen that seemed to linger for a while, like Lillian said with the cinnamon. Um, so the textures were soft and the bitter gourd was kind of chewy, which I actually really like in terms of texture and it was really comforting. Um, so you can see there, I served it over some cold yogurt right after I cooked it. So I had that kind of cold stabilizing yogurt to balance out all of the different flavors going on. Um, it was spicy and sweet, but the sweet came from me. I actually added a little bit of agave nectar when I was cooking it. So because of bitter gourd is actually very bitter. Um, so if anyone is interested in cooking this, I would suggest going through steps to um, take some of the bitterness out of the gourd before you're cooking it. Um, there are lots of options online if you look it up. A lot of it involves soaking it and kind of squeezing out um, before cooking it, which takes a lot of the bitterness out. This also, this dish, as it originally came out, is very low uh, glycemic index, so it's great for diabetic mothers. Um, but if you do want to add maybe a sugar alternative or some raw sugar, a little bit to taste, I really liked how it balanced out the bitterness. Um, and it also uses a lot of um, cauliflower in there, which I realized kind of thickens the dish. So that made sense to me with how a lot of people are cooking with cauliflower now. Um, and I love garlic. So there's garlic and turmeric and coriander and chili powder and make it as spicy as you would like it. Um, I really enjoyed eating the dish and I ate it all for myself. Um, so thank you very much for listening and um, happy International Day of the Millet. All right. Thank you, Amanda. So my name is Katie Etherington, and I live in the Phoenix, Arizona area. I'm about to start my integration semester in midwifery school, and I'm looking forward to graduating in a few months. Um, I've enjoyed being in the Phoenix area. I've had the opportunity to work with some large practices, but ultimately I hope to get back to my hometown, which is a small rural town um, in Northern Arizona. So we'll see what happens. Uh, like Amanda, I also chose the country of India. Uh, I lived and worked in India for several months some years ago, and it really holds a special place in my heart. I absolutely fell in love with the culture and the amazing people that I met. One of the things that I really loved about India was the blend of old and new. On one hand, you had practices that were based on hundreds, if not thousands, of years of tradition, and on the other hand, you had these modern technologies that were starting to make their way into this ancient culture. For example, seeing a traditional thatched roof mud hut with a satellite dish on top, or seeing a woman wearing a traditional sari, but talking on a cell phone. The blend of old and new was everywhere. The childbearing experience in India has a similar blend of old and new. As Amanda talked about, there are practices rooted in ancient uh, Ayurvedic principles, as well as practices adopted from modern Western medicine. Women across the country have childbearing practices that may vary significantly. It really depends on where they are, their religion, their access to resources, and how they personally balance the modern with the traditional. As Amanda discussed in her presentation, there are some barriers that the midwives in India are working to overcome to be able to reach more women. Uh, the dish that I chose to make for this uh, project is a traditional dish served during the postpartum period. In India, postpartum is traditionally considered a cold condition and pregnancy a hot condition. In the postpartum period, women eat and drink hot foods. And like Amanda said, that does not necessarily mean the physical temperature. They also receive hot oil massages, often daily, which sounds pretty nice to me. I'm trying to see if I can convince my mom to do that for me for my next baby, but we'll see. <laughs> During postpartum, there's a period called confinement that lasts about 40 days. During this period, the woman is expected to rest and bond with her new baby. Visitors are limited and the woman is expected to stay in her home or her mother's home. 
the cooking, cleaning, and other responsibilities are usually taken care of by female relatives, sometimes members from the village if she lives in a rural area. For my dish, I chose to make olive kheer. That's what's shown in my picture. It's considered a hot food and is typically served traditionally during the postpartum period. And although it's considered a hot food, it may actually be eaten warm or cold. The staple ingredient in this dish is the olive seed or garden crest seed. Uh, this seed has been used traditionally for hundreds of years in both pregnancy and postpartum. And it's been used not just in India, but across the Middle East. The garden crest seed is a good example of the ancient wisdom in traditional Indian medicine. The seed is high in iron and folic acid, which now we know are needed in higher quantities in pregnancy and postpartum. But this seed was being used long before we knew anything about its nutritional makeup. So that was really interesting to me. The hardest part of this recipe was actually finding the garden crest seeds. Um, but once I found the seeds, the rest was relatively simple. Uh, to start, you soak the seeds in some water for about two to three hours until they get kind of a gelatinous consistency. Then you boil them in whole milk for about five minutes. After five minutes, you add some brown sugar and boil for another five minutes until the porridge starts to thicken. Then you remove it from the heat. You add cinnamon, nutmeg, chopped dried dates, and chopped almonds. The dish has a warm, pleasant aroma from the cinnamon and the nutmeg. It makes for a hearty breakfast, but you could also add some extra brown sugar and serve it as a dessert. I think especially if you served it cold, it would make a good dessert. It was similar in texture to almost like a tapioca pudding with kind of that lumpy um, texture. And I use dates and almonds, but you could do any variety of dried fruits or nuts. And even fresh fruit would probably taste good in this porridge as well. And I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Happy International Day of the Midwife. Um, excuse me just one minute, Blythe, before you go on. I just wanted to let everyone know that the next session, it will be starting in um, 15 minutes in room two. So just so you know that. And we are running a little bit late in this session, but that's okay because there's nobody coming into this room afterwards. So um, I just don't want to, uh, I don't want to cut anyone off, but to let you know that there is another session with uh, Janelle Komorowski in room two and 15 minutes. Thank you, Lorraine. Go ahead, Blythe. Okay, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Blythe Everly. Um, I live in Berlin, Maryland in the United States. And um, my presentation today is going to be focused around midwifery in Poland, um, also including the uh, recipe for a childbearing mother. I chose this culture specifically um, because my family is from Poland. Um, they immigrated from Poland to Ellis Island. So it um, has a special place in my heart. Um, so about 30 years ago in Poland, um, childbearing women had few rights in their labor and birth care. Hospitalized were medicalized and women were expected to follow standard procedures. Visitors were not allowed. Babies were cared for in nurseries and they were separate from their mothers and as a result, breastfeeding rates were low. Additionally, there were few options for pain relief and episiotomies were routinely completed. Women began to push back against this and um, in a movement called Childbirth with Dignity, calling for respectful and compassionate care during labor and birth. Professional midwives were established in Poland and they were very active in the positive changes made for women in Poland. Polish women were expected to live by the Old Testament, by a verse, um, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Children were considered a blessing and important to for agricultural work that sustained many Polish families. 
having many children were allowed for multiple hands to work in the fields and flourish their established culture. Barwinek, a type of myrtle, was used during wedding ceremonies to assure fertility. And Poles believed that if the women had an appetite for sour food, they would bear a son. So a popular dish um, in Poland that was sour and very simple to make is called miseria. And it is provides fiber, potassium, magnesium, vitamin K, and calcium. If a pregnant woman, woman had an appetite for this dish, she might believe that she is having a son, and she is actually about 50% right. So this dish involved burpless cucumbers, half of a white onion, white vinegar, salt, pepper, three heaping a uh, tablespoon of sour cream, and then one heaping tablespoon of Miracle Whip that all mixed together, very simple to make, um, is the dish Metheria. And this is actually a recipe I got from my grandmother. It is something that she made all my life, and I had no idea until um, doing this project um, the um, nutritious value that it had and actually the history behind the meal. Um, and it was something I always looked forward to eating um, when I would go and visit my grandmother. So now um, for myself, I'm very excited to have this recipe and to be able to make it for myself and my family. And maybe if I have a taste for this dish in the future, I will bear a son. Um, so I thank you all for listening and happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you, Blythe. Uh, my name is Crystal Velasquez. I am currently in Connecticut in the United States, and I am from Puerto Rico. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, and my family came up here, uh, came to the United States in Connecticut when I was around six years old. Um, so for this project, I, I actually asked my aunt um, what do Puerto Ricans usually do for midwives or do for pregnant women during um, pregnancy, during labor, or and even postpartum. And she said that there was nothing to do, which I found very interesting. Um, so Puerto Rico is an island in the Caribbean, uh, and there's a mix of cultures that include uh, the Native Americans called Tainos, the uh, Spaniards and African kind of heritage and culture. Midwives are usually known as comadronas. And in right before the mid 20th century, there was about 1,500 um, registered midwives in Puerto Rico. But after the the era of the industrialization, sorry, um, the beliefs involved with childbearing were kind of lost. And because there were so many more advances in healthcare and medicine, they ended up just doing, uh, just going into hospitals and choosing more medical treatment options than they had previously. So some of the beliefs that kind of were lost and I was able to find and documented was that they like to drink warm fluids to help them augment labor. They felt that warm teas like ginger teas um, or they would use a rue or a ruda plant um, teas would help heat up the contractions and augment the labor. Um, they also would do a massage right after birth for the, um, to kind of help expel the placenta and they would prefer to use some olive oil for those massages, um, which doesn't sound too bad for me. Uh, and then they would also like to use, for the postpartum period, uh, they considered that also a cold bodily state. So they wanted to use warm liquids and light foods uh, to help nu give nutrition to the woman in the postpartum period. Uh, what I chose to do is the asopao de pollo, which is just basically a really hearty chicken stew uh, with rice in it, or uh, rice served with it. And it's really a, a comfort food. 
Um, we, uh, my family has made it, makes it all the time. If you're sick or if family's coming over or if it's just like a rainy day, we love to make this stew. And you can cut, you could always make it your own. Um, it's a lot of chicken broth and uh, pieces of chicken. You can use whole chicken chunks or cut up chicken breast. Um, carrots, potatoes, celery, basically anything you want to put into it, you can, and you could kind of make it your own. A lot of the seasonings are used throughout of any Hispanic dish, um, uh, and it's really good to make. It's not, it doesn't take quite that long. It's maybe about an hour total. Uh, rice takes about 30 minutes to make, and you put in the chicken first with the seasoning, and then you add in all the vegetables and and um and the chicken broth and water afterwards but it is it's really good it was really nice making it i i went to my aunt's house and made it with my family the first time um and it's just like a good bonding moment uh, just to uh kind of get around the family which is what we're used to and then being able to help the mom afterwards i think is the main point and making sure she's comfy while she's taking care of a newborn baby um, and that's my presentation. Have a happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you, Crystal, and all our students. I, um, I'm going to wrap up with a, a little bit about the recipes I chose to contribute to our cookbooks. Um, I chose recipes from the Amish culture and in the second edition, the English culture. This is a sort of an interesting choice because the Amish people refer to all non-Amish people as English, regardless of where they come from. For the last eight years, I've served as a locum tenens midwife in Holmes County, Ohio, which as Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, is one of the places with a concentrated population of Amish. They're known for their home cooking and baking, but watch out, they are not known for low calorie or low fat foods. Their meals are hearty and delicious, like this chicken noodle dish with biscuits uh, and a peanut butter sauce that is uh, rather unique to the area. You find this at all the Amish res restaurants and uh, in Amish homes. It's made with peanut butter, uh, corn syrup and marshmallow fluff, and they'll use it much like a jam um, on their breads. I love working with the Amish women. They view childbearing as hard working and they value midwifery care and the hallmark of non-intervention in the absence of indications that we bring to that care. In the second edition of the cookbook, I chose English scones and tea. And I'm very delighted to share with you that I will be spending fall term in Oxford, England as a faculty in residence through a program uh, in cooperation with Georgetown University and Oxford University. Midwifery in the US is still growing, but it uh, remains small in numbers and therefore impact. Uh, developed countries with better perineal outcomes use midwives as the primary care provider for childbearing women such as in the UK. So we need here in the US a cultural shift in the way maternity care is structured in order to fully realize the promise of midwifery in um, improving outcomes in the US. So what I hope to explore uh, are midwifery yet led units in the UK and see what lessons they have for the US. Um, I hope any listening British midwives will contact me. I'd love to, to connect. I'm also very eager to embrace tea time with scones and clotted cream and Earl Grey or English breakfast tea. And these are apricot ginger pecan scones that I made and they are delicious. I just wanna summarize the presentation by uh, talking about the primary responsibility of educators, which is to craft learning activities that engage students and facilitate knowledge acquisition and skill development. Powerful learning occurs by doing. Lived experiences connect muscle and memory with emotion and all the five senses, and this leads to learning with lasting resonance. 
This experiential activity connecting childbearing, culture, and food helped students develop a more holistic view of diet counseling, uh, sparked important social connections, as you heard in their stories, and provided a deeper level of engagement in understanding their chosen cultural group. Food is an important aspect of culture, as unique to a culture as its language. Cultural beliefs and preferences around food choices are very important in pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. Food fuels the body, and it provides the building blocks for fetal growth, maternal health, breastfeeding success, and newborn health. In order to give nutritional advice that is sound and culturally accepted, students need to understand a woman's dietary preferences, access to food, and ability to store and prepare food. Exploring cuisines and cooking techniques of various cultures can inform a provider's dietary counseling with practical and palatable suggestions, such as those presented by our students today. And these are designed to nourish women's bodies and spirits at a time when nutrition is critical to positive health outcomes. Bon appetit, everyone, and happy International Day of the Midwife. Thank you for your kind attention. And uh, if we have time, we'd be happy to have questions or comments. Thank you, Cindy. That's wonderful. Um, we can continue to have some questions if we like, um, as long as everyone recognizes that the other session is starting, or it has started already, um, in room two. So. Uh, we, but we can run over a little bit here, that's okay. Are there any questions? There have certainly been lots of wonderful comments of people sharing what uh, traditions that they uh, they have in their cultures and uh, talking about the food, which is, all oh, looks so delicious. Um, and I see a question here from Naomi. She's asking, can we buy the book online? Oh, lovely question. Um, the first edition cookbook is available at the American College of Nurse Midwives uh, store, and so you will find it there. Uh, we are we just uh, printed up the second edition, so it's sort of hot off the presses. We're going to sell this at the ACNM uh, conference coming up, and. Uh, we might be able to uh, put the second edition up at the same store. We'll see how that goes. But uh, I appreciate it. Anyone who wants uh, a copy could uh, email me. And is my email available, Lorraine, or no? Um, just put it in the chat, Cindy. OK. And I can arrange, um, let's see, there it is. Mm -hmm. There we go. Just, just email Cindy if you're looking for a copy of the second edition. Yes. And I would just like to say the beautiful uh, illustration on the front of the cover is by an artist named Heidi Schultz. And she might have more recognition um, as the artist who drew Bob of Bob's Red Mill Grains, which is on every package of the uh, oats and, and uh, grains that he sells. So I, I was delighted about that. Are there um, any other questions? Well, thank you, Lorraine. It's been a pleasure and I'll see you next year. Absolutely. Have a wonderful time in England. And thank you to all the students of Cohort 26 and to Jean Jacobitz as well. Yes, I'm so proud of uh, our students, and uh, and Jean and I uh, both are. So thank you. All. Absolutely. Yes. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.